I'm ready to open it up for questions. And I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, we'd. Um, I, I guess you've explained things pretty well, Chris. Uh, right now, we don't have any uh, questions, but I'm sure there are some. So I'd ask uh, the folks to go ahead and enter them in the Q and A bubbles down there. Um, and meanwhile, um, let me ask you a question that um, I, I understand that you're looking at the long run. Uh, a lot of the statistics are based on fairly long run performance of these port various portfolios under different conditions. And, you know, part of the point is to show you which ones perform best uh, in a variety of conditions that were experienced during that term. But um, if we look at someone, it, it's likely that most of our audience is in or near retirement, as they like to say. And uh, what I'm wondering is, uh, for those folks who have retired in the last five years or 10 years, what would have been their experience? Their exper it, it looked like from one of your last charts there that that their underperformance of the S&P, I, I guess what I'm really asking is when you have a set of uh, a sequence of you is about sequence of return risk ultimately that when you have a a sequence uh of years not just one year that you have to get through but multiple years where um for the most part your approach is not performing quite as well uh you know and you're withdrawing uh, right. That's a key element of it. And if you're not withdrawing, it doesn't make any difference. But if you're withdrawing, it makes a difference. So, you know, how, how do you work through that, I guess? Uh, yeah, I actually have. Uh, can you see this slide? I think I've. Yes, yeah, we can see it. Yeah. So this is a slide that speaks to this question. Um, when I, you know, we do try to scare people to some extent, uh, just let them know that there are these long periods of time when investing in small and value can underperform. And we do that because we don't want people performance chasing, switching in and out of investments. But uh, there's a website called ifa.com that has a series of charts and tools that I, I find very valuable uh, for some of these teaching questions. And one of the questions is how often over what period of, over different periods of time does small cap value outperform large cap blend? And even at one year, the odds of small cap value outperforming are about 55 and a half percent. At three years, it's 58 percent. At five years, it's 62 percent. I'm rounding here. Ten years, 74 percent. At 20 years, it's 99.5 percent. So what that says is as a retiree, if I were to invest a part of my portfolio in small cap value, that part of my portfolio is expected over time to outperform. It may underperform. It's kind of a coin toss within a year. But um, other than the fact that it is a little more volatile, so I'm going to experience more ups and downs in it than I do the S&P 500, I'm not really doing anything imprudent um, because I have increased my expected return and I have increased my diversification. Now, I certainly wouldn't go all in on small cap value because now you've taken on a lot of volatility. You've gotten you've gotten rid of a different kind of diversification. Um, but uh, yeah, I think for retirees, it comes down to for most retirees, I think the best hedge against this kind of volatility and the way you're going to ensure that your portfolio lasts is to take on a fair amount of bonds or fixed income. And that's that's reflected up here in these charts where we looked at the um, the safe withdrawal rates. If you look at the safe withdrawal rates, uh, the one with the best safe withdrawal rates right here, uh, a lot of these high bond allocations over on the right hand side uh, are very high in safe withdrawal rates when mixed with uh, and and you can see a variety of them here through the middle, but. Um, taking on bonds is going to reduce the port, the volatility of the portfolio, but it's also going to provide you from se uh, some sequence of returns risk. And, and, and as a retiree myself, 
I, I, I really value this, um, this metric, the safe withdrawal metric, because it's the best proxy on this chart for, am I going to run out of money? What's the probability I'm going to run out of money? If I have a safe withdrawal rate is, that is much higher than what I need to live on every year, I have a very low probability of running out of money. If I have a safe withdrawal rate, a historical safe withdrawal rate that's close to what I need to live on every year, then I have a higher probability of running out of money. And if if the safe withdrawal rate of my portfolio is significantly less than what I have to take out every year, then I have a nervously high level of risk that I will, will run out of money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that was good. Um, okay. We, uh, we have now, uh, folks have uh, entered questions. We have a number of questions. So oh, uh, let's start working on them. Um, Ricky asks, if using two fund for life strategy, what would your asset location strategy, especially with Vanguard TDF, especially with the Vanguard uh, TDF debacle a few years ago when the TDF was in uh, a taxable account? Yeah, that was that was a really unfortunate moment for Vanguard. Uh, and I, I think it was uh, uncharacteristic of them. They're usually really good about trying to be good stewards for their shareholders and investors, which are the same, you know, their owners and investors. What happened was they changed the the way the funds were structured in a way that uh, made it so a lot of investors realized a capital gain without having traded anything. And uh, that created a taxable event for people holding the target date fund in their taxable accounts. I don't anticipate that that would happen, happen again. They did it to get the expense ratio down lower. It's at about, it's 0.08%, I believe and to have that low expense ratio across all of their funds. So I think that was a, an uncharacteristic thing for them to have done and something uh, unusual to have happened to a target date fund. But I would encourage people where possible, obviously, to hold the target date fund in a tax deferred account because it is where the bonds are and it's where they're gonna have a lot of income, especially over time into the future. Um, it's one of the drawbacks of the two fund for life strategy. You don't have as much control over asset location. And that's one reason somebody might, for example, want to look at the allocations that I put up on that chart and implement it not with target date funds, but with other index funds. Because if you in implemented it with index funds, then you regain this control over your asset allocation. You could put all of the bonds in your tax deferred accounts and you could put the equities in the tax deferred accounts too, maybe, maybe not, maybe you have limits that restrict that. Maybe you have to get the small cap value in a, in a uh, different brokerage account. It, it, in any event, it gives you more control and that might be useful, yeah. Okay. Uh, someone is asking us, should the market rates of interest impact equity versus fixed income allocations? And he reminds us that for decades, rates were much lower uh, versus the uh, interest rates were much lower than they are today. Yeah, this is a market timing question. And I do everything I can to avoid any market timing in my own behavior or my own advice, because I my fundamental belief about market timing is that the market can remain irrational longer than I can remain, li than I can remain liquid. Uh, that's a, um, is a JP Morgan quote, I think. I'd, I'd have to go back and figure out who it was, but it, it, it's hard even when you know that you're at a moment where things are overvalued or that interest rates might trend in a different direction to know that they will do that tomorrow they can continue in the direction they're going in and not change or, or or change faster than you expect. It's like trying to predict when a branch is going to break. You can hear it cracking, but you don't know when it's going to break. And uh, so I really avoid as much as I can market timing. And I don't really think anybody else has shown that they're extremely skilled at it. 
and so that 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 that's kind of my starting point on that. We have gone through a period of time from 1970 until just recently that was very very good for bonds, and now we've gone through a period of time that was historically bad for bonds. Does that pretend that the future now is going to be very good for bonds? I don't know. I don't know how fast interest rates will change. It's it's these market timing questions are so unpredictable uh, and so hard to act on with any conviction that we do everything we can to avoid them. Okay, that's great. I think it was Keynes who sometimes is credited with uh, uh, the business about the market being a Russian. Uh, um, thanks for that. The uh, okay. Another uh, an, another question is: Thank you, Chris. Any drawbacks with small cap value investing? How about using the total stock market only instead of the S and P and SCB? I uh, so the the drawbacks of investing in small cap value are essentially that you you need to invest like rip van winkle you need to invest with conviction and hold for a long period of time and so it's important that you develop confidence in the history and for a lot of people they're going to look at it and say you know i have 10 percent confidence in the history i'll put a 10 percent allocation in my portfolio or 20 percent confidence that's fine some is better than none um, the total market, as I pointed out earlier, doesn't have any tilt to small in value, nor does large cap blend the S&P 500. Both of them only give you market risk exposure. Uh, the difference between them historically in terms of performance and volatility is very small. So you can pick whichever one you like. I like the I like the S&P 500 because there's no tracking error. I like the total market because there's no, I'll call it uh, a cocktail. Uh, I, I don't go to cocktail parties, but a cocktail party discussion, anxiety around not owning the latest hot thing. If you own the total market and somebody comes up and says, uh, hey, what about company XYZ? Have you heard about it? I'm going to make all my money on it. And you can go, I own that, right? You know, that's the great thing about the total market. And combining either one of them with small cap value is a, a great idea because small cap value gives you additional market risk exposure, but it also gives you exposure to the small and the value parts of the market, which are not going to move in lockstep with the, the total market. And so that's going to give you this chance to have a higher return per unit of risk like we saw in the charts we looked at. Yeah. Okay. And so even though um, total market has all those small caps in it, they're, their total uh, cap, so to speak, really does well, offset the yeah, large you, ones. The small ones offset the large ones and the blend or, and the growth ones offset the value ones. So although those stocks are in there, you don't get any of the premium or the diversification because uh, the the way those parts of the market are defined is really as, as uh, the small minus the large or the value minus the growth. And if you own them both, you you got zero, you got nothing. Uh, yeah. The only way you get the tilt is to own a disproportionate amount from what exists in a cap weighted index. And the easiest way to do that is to add a fund that is concentrated in those parts of the market. Yep. Okay. Um, Sunil is asking <laughs> us, um, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, the slides uh, brilliantly compiled what the Merriman Foundation advocates. What strategies can we adopt to manage the behavioral aspects of tracking errors, especially when most of the financial press talks about two indices in the U.S. and are enamored with the latest tech stock? This is a tricky one. Uh, this is a really tricky one. I, I don't think I could give you, I can't give you a well-researched answer. I'll just give you my answer. So, uh, I, every single time I'm tempted to trade, I force myself to stop and go do analysis and talk to my wife and to prove to myself that it's going to put me in a better position for the future. And nine times out of 10, somewhere in that process, I get derailed and I don't. So as a buy and hold investor, 
I think it's good to build habitual roadblocks to trading too much. I avoid all of the um, the financial media that is full of energy. I actually do this in news media. Well, if, if there's a lot of emotion in it, I avoid it uh, because I figure it's a self-serving behavior on the part of the media to try and get me riled up and excited. So I'll keep tuning in. The bad part in personal finance is that a lot of times that leads to bad investor behavior. So I think look away, look away as much as you can, not to the point of being ignorant, but if the if the media and the news that you're getting is overly titillating or overly exciting, it's probably not the part that's informing you. The part that's going to be more informative and educational is going to feel a little bit drier and less emotional. And so I try to steer my education in that direction. And then I also try not to look too often at my accounts because they're there for the long term, not the short term. Right, right. Okay. Uh, Sunil has a, a second question that's in a different area. So go ahead and ask it. Do you have any opinions on a strategy of liability matching portfolio with tips and having a rising equity portfolio as one ages? I guess there are two questions there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, uh, I think tips are uh, a lot of people got enamored with tips in the last couple of years because we have been through this period of time with inflation and you can build a tips ladder in retirement that is, you can be very confident it's going to provide you what you need if you have, you know, a specific level of income need and it's in, it's uh, protected against inflation by the U.S. government. So I, I can understand why that is interesting. It doesn't interest me that much because I know enough about a broadly diversified equity and bond portfolio to feel like I can get to the same place. Uh, equities historically have been a good hedge against inflation in the long term, not necessarily the short term, but in the long term. And so I don't feel I need to add that additional inflation insurance, if you will. Um, the rising equity allocation in retirement, I think, is very rational. And a good way to explain it is if you follow Christine Benz's work on the bucket strategy in retirement, she says you should have a, a certain number of years of, uh, of, in, of spending available in short term to medium term bonds, then medium term bonds, and then your, the, the money you're going to spend in later years in equities. Well, if you figure out how much money you're going to need to spend, and you put a certain percentage into short term, your short term bucket in bonds, and then another bigger, you know, the, the rest in long term, that's effectively an asset allocation. So if you are a an oversaver, that's going to be a very aggressive allocation. If you're an undersaver, it's going to be a very conservative allocation. But what's going to happen, hopefully, over time is that the equities are going to outgrow the bonds and if you are just keeping those buckets the same size based on your living expense requirements and they're not expanding with the market, then you're gonna see a smaller and smaller allocation to bonds as you age. Now, the footnote to all of this is that you're gonna see if that happens an increasing volatility in your portfolio as you age. And what I've noticed among my friends is that a lot of people become more risk averse as they get older, even if they have oversaved. And so you want to make sure at all of the points along the way that your the risk that you've taken in your portfolio doesn't exceed what I'll call your panic stop. So, for example, if you're somebody who's going to panic sell at a 50 percent drawdown, you should not be in a portfolio that historically has had a 60 percent drawdown. That would be a bad thing because there's a chance you're going to panic sell, uh, you know, a higher chance that you're going to panic sell when you shouldn't. Um, but as long as you stay within your own risk tolerance, uh, I think there's a lot of rationality to that increasing equity allocation, because in many respects, especially if you're underspending that that growing portfolio it's not for you it's for charities and the next generation and they might as well see it grow yeah yeah okay i just out of curiosity i know a lot of folks uh you know, in the meeting today are probably ai members and have probably uh seen christine ben's presentations on bucket portfolios have y'all done any explicit studies or 
or articles on combining your strategies with the bucket portfolio? Well, in, you know, her bucket strategy effectively results in a portfolio that is pretty close to an S&P 500 and bonds portfolio or total market and bonds portfolio. And we have uh, we have a, we have portfolios like that we, that we have back tested on the website and the actual allocation you end up with is using the bucket strategy going to depend on how you have saved. So the fact that we cover a wide range of allocations, uh, I think, would let you find a point on those charts that would tell you something about how they have performed in the past. Yeah. OK, good. Um, oh, uh, the next one is uh, someone is asking uh, what small cap value funds or ETFs do you recommend? Uh, we have a set of best in class recommended funds that are listed on our website. I actually I had those in my slide presentation, so I'll pull those back up. And you can go find them on the website and uh, let's see, they're up here in ingredients, I think, right? Nope, not there, right here. Can you see those? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So for the U.S. small cap value, uh, the fund we recommend is Avantis U.S. small cap value AVUV. But in addition to the best in class recommendations, we also have alternative recommendations over here for people whose 401ks might restrict them to a particular fund family that doesn't include our best in class recommendation. And these will be updated at the beginning of next year. Okay. Um, I guess in a somewhat similar vein, Jim's asking, are any other, uh, are there any other investment companies to consider for the target date funds? And, and uh, you know, for example, Fidelity, Schwab, BlackRock, that sort of thing. Yes. Uh, and in fact, uh, Paul recently mentioned BlackRock in his podcast because he looked at a 401k that had BlackRock instead of Vanguard. And he spoke well of it because it has a higher equity allocation in the earlier years and a higher equity allocation in retirement. The reason I don't put a lot of time into analyzing a best in class recommendation of target date funds is that most people are going to have a very limited selection in their retirement retirement savings tool. And rather than letting perfect be the enemy of good enough, I, I would rather have them focus on getting their savings rate up and taking advantage of that default and adding some diversification into small cap value rather than enviously looking over the fence at a slightly better target date fund that's available somewhere else that they can't get to. So, um, but if you do, like if you're investing in a target date fund through a brokerage account and you have multiple ones available to you, then I would point you at Morningstar's annual target, uh, target date fund uh, analysis. They do a very good analysis of the families of funds and how they compare and uh, if if I was trying, in fact, I was trying to decide uh, on a target date fund for a two fund for life portfolio at Schwab. And so I went and looked at what Morningstar had to say about that target date fund because I didn't have Vanguard available to me commission free. Yeah. OK, good. Uh, another question is, uh, if I am 60 and adopt one of the buy and hold strategies, should I expect the result? Should I expect the results to be within a twenty-year or a forty-year time frame, according to my life expectancy? Well, you should expect that the results are going to fluctuate, <laughs> and you should expect that over time, the number, the compound rate of return number that you see will be closer and closer to what it historically has been, but that in your first year, it'll be very volatile. And then it'll, you know, it'll, it, when you average over two years or three years or four years or five years, it's going to fluctuate over a narrower range. We showed the annual standard deviation of returns. Uh, the five-year standard deviation is narrower. The 10-year standard deviation is narrower. 
but uh you know it's it's going to be uncertainty uncertain there's a lot of risk in any portfolio whatever you choose there is no guarantee in fact um larry swedro recently did an article where he pointed out that there's no guarantee that equities will outperform bonds over a 20 year period of time uh, you can go 20 and 40 years and and make a simple choice like that that i think equities are going to be better than bonds and have it not play out in your favor so that's one of the reasons diversification is so important is that you don't know which of these is actually going to win and so even though small cap value is the best performing asset historically over the history that i look at and the asset classes i look at i don't put all of my investments in small cap value i own a portion of my portfolio in small cap value and then a portion in these other asset classes in hopes that together they all deliver deliver me a good return per unit of risk and probably again the most important thing for a retiree considering that ultimate buy and hold portfolio is how much bonds how much fixed income do you need with it to um, give you some meaningful diversification and risk reduction so that that increase that that will narrow the range of results it will increase your confidence that you're going to get a return it may be a lower return but it'll be a less uncertain return Okay. And which actually, I, I think kind of, uh, because again, part of the, the issue in a retirement account is that you are withdrawing from it. You yes. can ignore it and let it grow the way you can in the accumulation phase. So, uh, which leads us to Bill's question. Uh, you described the nudge rebalancing approach. What rebalancing approach is most effective long-term? Assuming that you're withdrawing along the way. You know, I have done various modeling and analyses over the years of different withdrawal approaches, rebalancing approaches, both of them. And I've never come up with anything that was what I would call numerically significant or profound, whether you rebalance and withdraw yearly, whether you don't rebalance and use nudge withdrawals. I did compare the nudge withdrawals to uh, the rebalance and withdrawal or re withdraw and rebalance. And it just didn't change things very much. So, so that's why I did the nudge withdrawals is that I knew that for some people, it was gonna be this math problem, right? If, if you tell somebody you have to go into the account and figure out what percentage this fund is greater than it's supposed to be and then you know take your withdrawal in a way that it it just it, it turns it into something a lot of people i didn't think would do and in our own retirement what we have found is that we do nudge withdrawals there's almost always an asset that is bigger than it's supposed to be by more than the four percent and so we just take our whole withdrawal from that and i thought well if it's going to be that simple in practice why make it more complicated in the advice and the recipe we give to people? Now, if you have 10 funds um, and no one of them has dramatically outperformed, then um, the difference of nudge withdrawals starts to matter because now you're talking about individual allocations that are 10% and you're talking about taking out 4%. You can you can basically overshoot by a greater amount. So I think as you get into a portfolio with more funds, it makes more sense to take from the whole portfolio or use your withdrawal to rebalance the portfolio. And I'm sure a lot of the people on this call will know how to do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um. Okay. Well, someone's asking, what is the best way to invest in small cap values? Patiently. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think that the ETFs are really, if you could invest in the best in class ETFs that we recommend, uh, they are very tax efficient. So I, I like the ETF because the wrapper makes the investment more tax efficient. You don't get these unexpected capital gains that you see out of mutual funds. If you can do it in a tax deferred account and reinvest the dividends, then you don't even have to pay taxes on the dividends that are coming in and you're more of a total return kind of investment and that's even better. So those would be 
the two top of mind things that come. If you're if you're a young investor, dollar cost average in and celebrate it when the market's down because you're buying it extra cheap. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, um, the uh, we're approaching. We're actually pretty much at twelve. So uh, let's just see what remaining questions we have. Um, here's Ricky asking. Why would the quality profitability factors have a premium? It seems uh, those companies are less risky. So why would you be compensated more to hold them? I, I'd encourage you to go read uh, Larry Swedro's book. The I think it's his ultimate guide to multi-factor investing. And he'll, he'll give you bigger definitive answers on that. I think that uh, my quick answer would be that there, the market is mostly efficient to a point, and then human behavior kicks in on top of that. And we tend to overestimate the impact of bad news and underestimate the impact of good news. And I think it's the behavioral attributes that probably help explain that. But Larry's book is a really good source uh, for a deeper understanding of all of these factors and attributes. Okay. Um, I think you've touched on this, but I'll, I'll just ask it. Uh, what, what do you, what do you think about simplifying and using VT, uh, the Vanguard world fund allocation to uh, global composition? I, I think it's great. And in fact, the charts that I showed at the end, you could use VT in place of the U S and international fund allocations and just do that all with VT. Uh, it's a really cost effective fund and and then all you're doing across that chart is mixing three funds you've got vt a small cap value fund and an intermediate term bond fund and with those three funds you can move anywhere on that chart and i i think that's a great idea yeah okay um i'll ask this one it's a little bit different uh paul's asking hi chris i acknowledge that everyone's comfort level would uh, is different. But if you're willing to share, Paul is curious about how much of a small cap value allocation you personally use. Uh, that's tricky to answer because we are, I, I'm going to answer it in the context of the portfolios that are not distorted by one investment that we have that is bigger than it should be because of tax reasons. So if you take that that one out of the mix, we tilt to small in value, uh, kind of in that 30 to 40% range. Um, that was our, our design point when we created our portfolios. Uh, we, we have some, uh, we, we have some equity holdings that uh, were there long before I started becoming a student of personal finance that for tax reasons you know even though we've tried to make them smaller have gotten bigger so that that's that's why i take that out of the mix and we, we're dollar cost averaging out of those but at least so far they've they've remained a problem but i i know from past experience that they can quickly become a non-problem <laughs> okay i um maybe just two more questions here um uh, one, I, I don't think you've exactly touched on. Uh, do the same Merriman asset allocation principles apply for Roth accounts as no taxes due on withdrawals and no RMDs? Yes, yes, they would. Okay, okay. Uh, and then, uh, oh, <laughs> Ben has a question. It is probably something that at least occurs to all of us as we look at all this and perhaps listen a little bit to the financial press. Do you have a fund portfolio you use for speculative plays? Could you use the talking heads, high energy picks as a contrary indicator? I do not. Uh, all of our all of our money is invested as prudently as we know how. And I have successfully resisted any temptation to buy Bitcoin uh, or individual stocks um, for the last uh, 10 or 20 years, probably. Yeah, ex except for my employer stock purchase plan, <laughs> right. um, which which always had so so much tilted in its favor that I would have been silly not to take advantage of it. So right, right. 
Okay, well, that that's very admirable, Chris. I don't know how many of us just don't have a little bit uh, of somewhere that we think may really yeah. do pretty well. Yeah, yeah it's just okay. not. I, I it's just not in my DNA, I guess. Okay. Um, uh, we do have a question about your website. I'll, I'll just point out that uh, everyone can go to our our website, the AAIHouston.org, and uh, find a copy of your your whole presentation, uh, including your website. But uh, Chris, if you'd like to tell us your website again. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, paulmerriman.com. And Paul is the founder of the Paul Merriman uh, Financial Education Foundation. And uh, Paul is the salt of the earth. He, he did this in retirement out of his own funds. There is no conflict of interest. It only exists to help people find a more profitable future by learning how to invest prudently and wisely. And I love that I get to work with Paul. He's a, a really wonderful guy. And um, hopefully you find stuff there that is useful and helpful. And uh, yeah, it's just paulmerriman.com. Okay. And um, Shri, Shri, yeah, Shri has posted that uh, in the chat. So you can go there and find it. Oh, good. So thank you, Shri. Uh, and I think that pretty much covers all the questions. I uh, appreciate your work, your, uh, your going ahead and doing that. I think the fact that in these kind of meetings, one of the real values is that our audience gets to ask speakers like yourself uh, questions, whereas uh, if they heard you in a lar larger venue or with a larger webinar, they wouldn't be able to ask those questions. So I it's, appreciate it. It's your my answer. favorite part of the meeting, too, because I learn a lot in the questions. I, I learn more about the audience. I, in an ideal scenario, we'd do this face to face. I, I would enjoy that much more, but I appreciate the questions and answer part. This is really fun. Chris, um, you wrote about contributions about from the standpoint of monthly, quarterly, or one-time quote unquote lump sum uh, intervals in terms of investing the cash at those different intervals. Um, but it ties in, and I know you looked at it from the standpoint of saving for retirement, uh, but a question I get on, you've probably had it too, is from someone who's sat on the sidelines, I have this cash and I want to get back in, what's the best way to do it? Uh, and could you say what you found out when you looked about as spreading over monthly, quarterly, uh, or yearly, or doing it once, what you found out in terms of the impact uh, on portfolio growth and returns? Sure. Uh, the, the expected return that you'll get is highest if you invest it all right away. The risk that you enable is highest if you will invest it all right away. That's the gist of, of what you learn when you do these back tests and analysis. So from a behavioral standpoint, if you're really concerned that you're gonna have this deep regret that you've invested it all and the market drops the following day, dollar cost averaging or investing slowly over time is a great way to address that concern. And you can decide whether you're gonna invest it daily for a month to get it all in or monthly for a year or you know, quarterly for three years. The longer it takes you to get it in, the lower your expected return, um, but also the lower your risk. It's, it's a form of diversification. It's time diversification is what you're doing and that's why it lowers the risk. Uh, this shows up in a really meaningful way for young investors who are most for the most part, young investors can't do the lump sum investment. But if they could, if their whole life savings came to them all at once, the next day they would expose be exposed to the full potential downturn of the market. If we had a crash like in 1987, 
they would see a huge loss in their portfolio and it would probably rack their emotions and it might ruin them as an investor for life. Uh, if on the other hand, though, like most investors, they're getting the money on a monthly basis and they're investing it, they may not even notice a lot of market downturns because the cash flow is going to smooth the ride and they're going to see uh, much, much smaller downturns for the first 10 years, 10, 15 years that they're investing. In fact, most young investors starting with zero and doing regular investments will see smaller downturns or smaller drawdowns in their account, declines in the balance of their account, than they will see with a conservative target date fund at retirement. Um, so that that smoothing is a really powerful tool to help uh, avoid what might be an intolerable risk for a lot of people. Interesting. And then in terms of target date funds, um, obviously, as you know, they're the default option in many retirement plans. Uh, any suggestions about how someone might go about choosing one, uh, particularly their retirement dates not certain or they're falling in between those five or 10 year windows some of those funds are actually dated. Yeah, um, so you, usually the, the default and the fund family aren't gonna be things somebody has a lot of choice about. Um, the default will probably be the fund year that's closest to the year in which somebody turns 65 years old um, because that's generally perceived to be when they're likely to retire. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, in fact, if it nudges people to get investing earlier, all the better. Um, and most of the evidence is that it does. And not only does it get them investing earlier, but it also gets them investing more in equities earlier, uh, which are just fantastic benefits to a young investor. If somebody wants to second guess the choice uh, within fund years, if they invest in a fund that's a little bit farther out in time, say they're like right in the middle between two year choices. Um, if they invest in the one that's farther out in time, uh, their portfolio will be managed a little bit more aggressively. If they choose the one that's a little, a little bit nearer in time, their portfolio will be managed a little less aggressively, uh, but not until they're within 20 years, 25 years of retirement. So for a young investor, it doesn't matter. It's entire, it, it will make zero difference. As somebody's getting closer to retirement, that choice starts to make a small difference, but it's a small difference. Yeah. And uh, you use a lot of back testing in your book to test strategies. Uh, could you give us, and I know it's a, probably a lengthy answer, but uh, perhaps condense it a little bit, um, the argument why back testing is actually really helpful and then some of the so the pitfalls of relying on it. Sure. I, all we have in terms of understanding the future is the past. It's true in investing. It's true in life. Uh, you know, we assume the sun will come up tomorrow because it came up yesterday and we know a little bit about the physics and we assume that they're going to continue and the rules won't change. Uh, all, we, all we know about the future in investing comes from studying the past. And uh, so if we look back and we see patterns that happened in the past uh, over many, many different time periods, that suggests that they'll probably happen in the future. And if we, if we see patterns that happen rarely, um, then we, that suggests they probably won't happen in the future. So when we do our back testing, we're not looking for very tiny differences that only happened 50% of the time. We're looking for things that happened over 90% uh, of 600 different time periods. Um, and how do you get 600 different time periods? You take 50 years and you use every month as a different start date, and then you, you loop at the end. And, and so that means you go from, in our case with our back testing from 2021, or 2020 to 1970, and everybody goes, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Nobody says that 2021 is going to look like 1970, and it didn't, and that's true. Um, but if you if you don't do that, if you don't make at least one small assumption like that, you end up overweighting the years that are in the middle, um, because you can start in you know at the beginning, and then when you start running out of years, you've you've sampled the middle twice. So. No back testing is going to be perfect. This the same thing is true of Monte Carlo, though it's not perfect either. Uh, Monte Carlo simulations make a bunch of us uh, assumptions. 
they assume that either any year can be followed by any other year or that you know they will you always bootstrap by zero to 20 years um and so monte carlo simulations end up having less reversion to the mean than we actually see in the historical data uh, so all all of these are like fuzzy imperfect crystal balls but when you're trying to figure out what to do you need something and this is the best data that we have uh, so uh, i i think the fact that most of the strategies that we rec if not all of the strategies that we recommend uh, are backed up by uh, a preponderance of historical behavior that says it will benefit you uh, should give people comfort in following it great and finally uh in your book and i'll let our listeners know we'll have a link to it in the show notes um, you highlighted a lot of long-lived uh, animals and plants, um, from trees to reptiles. Um, is there a particular reason why you uh, chose to include those in a book about uh, investing for retirement? It, very much so. Uh, the title of the book is Two Funds for Life. And uh, I really wanted to step out of investing at the beginning of every chapter and have people remember that the reason we invest is to live. We don't live to invest. Uh, the reason we're doing all of this, the reason we study it all is to improve our lives, to make us financially secure for a longer period of time. And I think it's, uh, it's kind of a, a mental break when you're reading the book to step out and think about a different topic or a different subject. And uh, I, I love that um, it was a chance to uh, highlight my daughter's artwork too. She she did the artwork and I, I think she's an amazing artist and she has a love of life and it really shows through in her work. And it helped elevate my writing because it made me remember why I was doing it. It's not just to make money, it's to help people live better lives and have more time to enjoy the life they live. <laughs> 